Good afternoon. Um, so again, there will be no class on Friday. I'll be out of town. Um, so today I'd like to finish up audio, right? I'm not going to stress too much on the audio component because audio uses a different set of um, parameters than video in terms of um, figuring out which, which ones to drop. And we, we looked at it a little bit in the earlier, earlier um, lectures. Um, in general, audio is not usually as resource intensive as, as video. So usually it's, you know, it's given a second class treatment because um, there's, there's not a whole lot to transmit, right? The only difference is audio, um, you tend to notice things getting dropped. If a frame gets dropped, I can kind of mask it, right? Even if a whole frame is dropped, if I'm going from 30 frames per second to uh, 28 or 29 or something like that, you don't notice it as bad as if there's a drop in the noise. If, you, if you're watching TV or something, you suddenly notice like a one second drop, you notice that, um, especially when there's a conversation, you notice that. So you tend to make the audio be delivered in a, in a certain quality, right? Um, you, you, you don't notice if the fidelity goes down and goes up uh, all that much, but if it suddenly drops, you tend to notice that. So that's one thing you try to avoid. And it's, uh, but, but given the fact that it's not uh, as it's intensive as video, you're kind of okay, right? And the other thing was, you know, uh, the folks are asking about the, the Blu-ray stuff. So Blu-ray, it's supposed to support the MPEG-4 and the Microsoft um, Windows Media format, right? Um, so the, the standard allows the players to decrypt all of, all of those formats. The initial set of Blu-ray DVDs, Blu-ray discs which came out, used the MPEG-2 um, exclusively, but the newer ones can support MPEG-4, right? Um, it, it can support 40 megabits per second bitrate as opposed to 10 megabits per second for DVD. Uh, so if you use a MPEG-2, um, it's not as efficient, so you still, um, you still run into problems in terms of storage. I mean, I, I think you can only store two hours of video if you're using MPEG-2. MPEG-4, um, you can get away with, with more. Um, but again, the, the technology with MPEG-4 is still fairly new, and the cost associated with, with MPEG-4 decoding, it's still not amortized. So uh, you may see more of the MPEG-2s now, and in the future, you may see more of MPEG-4s, right? Um, and if you, any of you, I only know the dish DVR, so if you know dish DVR, you may notice that if you're recording some program over the air, it'll take a lot more uh, space than if you're recording toward the satellite, right? So how many of you have DVRs at, at, that you use? Digital video recorder to record your TV programs, right? So they, they usually tell you how much more content is left for you to store. So if they say you have 10 hours more to store, um, if you store a MPEG-4 uh, program coming off the satellite, you can, um, our program would only make it go to nine and a half or something, whereas an hour of over the air would make it go to eight hours, right? So, so, you, so you notice that the, the MPEG-4 is, uh, um, is better, right? So again, I'd like to finish up with the MPEG-4. The really cool stuff that MPEG-4 can do and the really cool stuff that may not be seen as much as the H.264 that we looked at in the last lecture, right? H.264 is more evolutionary from H.261, 6.2 kind of thing. Uh, it's still block-based. It's still trying to um, get you better compression using different algorithms and dropping certain components and more flexibility and stuff, but it's not as radically different as what MPEG-4 can do, right? MPEG-4, the model is the recognition that if you deal with what, what is really happening in, in, in the video is there are objects and stuff moving around, right? So it's not a set of, um, it's not, so you, you want to deal with it as in a block base because that's the easy way to deal with what is happening, right? But in reality, what's happening is something is moving. So if you're, if you're taking a video of, of me uh, when I move here, right, you can look at it on the microscopic perspective and, and look at the blocks and say, my, my shirt moved this far and, 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 and so on and so forth. But if you can kind of treat me as an object, right, so treat me as an object in terms of, let's say, send a representation of me, right, so then the other side is basically rendering what, what I am, right? So then you can say, you know, you place me at, at this time and then move me over here, then the other side can basically reanimate me. So it can re essentially regenerate what I look like, right? So that's the notion of an object-based system, 
right? So in that sense, you have to represent the the the, the things in the, in the object in in as object. Um, I mean, items in the screen as an object, not as blocks, but as a whole concept, right? That's that's where the complexity comes in. So now we need to do a lot of analysis to figure out what the objects are. So if I figure out what the objects are in the screen, like a human beings and all those things, then I can basically send the object, then I can do the transformations on what the object happens. So the transformations could be I'm um, moving this way, this way, I, I'm zoomed in, or I, I translate in a certain fashion. So then the amount of data to be sent is very small because all I'm saying is this particular object, it, it, certain things move, and you should um, do whatever, right? So that's the notion of our MPEG-4, and um, naturally, you know, it's a it's a newer scheme, so it's supposed to operate on a much higher bandwidth. In fact, um, you can go up to 40 megabits per second because that's what the Blu-ray uh, supports, right? So you can store more. You don't have to use the object-based system, but object-based system is what is cool about MPEG-4, right? So the the illustration from your book is basically. That right. So if you have the the scene where there's a car, there's a human being, they're walking around somewhere, right? The block-based schemes don't understand the concept that there's really uh, these two objects kind of moving a, a, around. So they treat them as basically take the block, do a motion vector, and try to detect where the where the things are, right? So it can it can see in the in the in in one frame it's here, then another frame is here. So you're trying to see where the match is, and you're trying to see where this particular scene matched. You're trying to see where this, where this, uh, how, how the motion was, right? It sort of works because it's, you're doing a brute force. You have no idea what happened in the scene. You're just trying to see which ones are over here are similar to which ones are here and how far they translated, and you're, you're encoding those. Instead, if I can figure out how to encode the object here and the object here, I have to send the object once. I basically say, um, put put this user here, put the car here, right, and overlay on top of each other. And then move the car at a certain rate, move the user at a certain rate, and you can potentially get a good, good compression, right? Um, in general, for if you're taking something of a video of, of, of somebody like me, then you go into basically uh, a lot of image processing to figure out what the objects are. So you don't know what the objects are, so you may have to do an analysis the whole video to figure out what the um, where the object is and to send it, right? So and here's another color color uh, fashion, so if I can send those three objects, then I can actually overlay them and, and do interesting stuff with them, right? And these are a lot more easier if the objects are already as objects. So if you're doing animation, um, so the, the animator essentially is trying to create creates these models and then they're trying to render them. Now they can actually send the models to the other side as object, right? So if you, when you're doing animation, the, the way you do that is you, 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 let's say you have a human being, so you, you, you generate a model, then you say where this particular model is moving, right? You figure out where those things are. And traditionally you would render them, meaning you'll see where this object would be, let's say this is at time zero seconds, this is one second. I try to see where this object would be, right? So at, at different times the object is moving across over here. So I'm going to <coughs> render them and then encode them, right? With this model, I can send the object, and then I can do this, send where this trajectory is, and uh, MPEG-4 would play, the, play it back, right? The, the reason why it's not fully rendering is because the rendering algorithm may use complex algorithms which figure out where the where the movement is, you know, based on gravity and all those things. Here, all I have to say is, in this in this scene, I'm here. In the next scene, just translated that much. Not why it translated and all those things. Just this this stuff, right? So the, the decoder can still be simple because all it has to do is it has to draw the background, it has to draw this object, and then keep moving it without knowing why it's moving or where it's moving, right? S simple uh, translations. Make sense, right? So the, the complication really in, in these schemes is how to do this stuff. And I don't think there's, there are too many encoders which let you do these things um, on the fly from any video, right? More interestingly, there are series, they, we will see certain applications where these things come naturally, right? Um, so for example, one of the applications is when you're watching a TV, right, and you have these these bars going around in the, in the when you're watching the TV, there's like these uh, low bars, right? And there's like 
um, all kind of like characters moving around on the scene, right? If you watch TV, this they seem to take over the the screen, right? So over here, you have this background video, and you're adding these objects, right? Those are being added by the, the, the TV broadcaster, not from the actual scene. So like for example, this may say something like ESPN or something, right? So then I know that this is an object that I'm creating, so I can, I can actually send this as object and worry about the, 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 the stuff in the background as the encoding stuff, right? So we can start from those where we are actually adding stuff which are, um, which are essentially models, so instead of, once we know what we're doing, we can just send those things to the player and they can, they can play that, right? Uh, and then we can slowly add them to more complex stuff. So again, since the, the complexity is on the encoder, um, if you come up with a encoder, good encoder in the future, we can exploit more of these features, right? So, so there's a lot of, lot of uh, detail on what, what, how the objects, how these things are specified, right? So there's the notion of a video sequence object, which sort of gives the background of, of the scene, so which the, so says, what's the background scene. And the different objects that you want to send, like the, the fruits in the, in the last section, um, and how these are overlaid, how the different layers are overlaid, and how these sort of move, right? And that's, that's what you, you would say in an MPEG-4. Um, and so now you have the same notion of I, B, and P, except these are operating on video objects. So I object would be the, the whole object, and P object would be predicted from the previous object and, and so on and so forth. Um, and the real challenge is the, the examples I gave, the objects are, are fairly circular, right? So it, it's, it's easy to figure out what, what happens. In, in real life, the object could be fairly complex, right? So I would have to define what this object is. I would have to show this object, which means that I have to say, I have an object which is, let's say, 16 by 16, right? I need to have some way of overlaying the, the creating this boundary, right? For which I would have to uh, say what, what, what the boundary is. Then I have to figure out what is in here. And this is called texture, right? So I have to send a texture map of what the object is. I have to send a boundary map of how the object is ends. And that's, all I have, that's how I specify what the object is. Does it make sense? So I I could if I could if it's a simple uh, object like a spear or something, I could say I want to send a spear, uh, you know, of of radius let's say 10 at a certain location, but that's very limiting because there's very few geometric objects, right? So they let you specify whatever object you want by basically figuring out what the uh, outline is and what goes inside, right? So then you can encode what goes inside using your the JPEG techniques. Basically, basically all that is is this is a sort of a picture, right? The inside is just a picture. So whatever you, you want the object to be. So if it's a face, so basically you take my picture, uh, my face as a as a picture, and send it as a texture. And then you have to figure out where my where my boundary is. That's that defines my object boundary. So I have to say. I have to say that this, these pixels define the boundary. So I, you decompose my object, my face, into this boundary, which, which says where my object is, and then a photograph, which shows my face. So on the receiving end, you have to get your, the, the lines. You put the outline, overlay my face on top of it, and you get uh, how I look like. Right? Again, this, all of this goes into more of an image processing aspect of how to do this stuff. And these are simple ways to specify what, what, what we are trying to send, right? So if you want my face to be moving across the scene, so basically you send this, my, my crude attempt at my face, then a picture of my face, right? And then essentially you say, at time t, draw these things. So, I send the background, right? And I say at time t equals zero, draw this object over here, which means that I draw this boundary, right? And I fill it with this stuff, the, my face stuff. And then I say at time t plus one, move, my, move me over here, in which case I draw this line and then fill it with my face and so on. And then you have the, uh, the motion, right?
and that, that's what he's trying to do. And, and then the book talks about the, the complications with specifying the, the boundaries, especially if it's in the, um, if, it's, if it's the middle or the, or the side, you know, the boundary of the, the bounding box you're sending. Um, again, you can, you can read it uh, as a FYI, but, um, but, the, but the main challenge is um, the encoder can make it really complicated and, and do stuff, right? It also introduced another notion called sprite, which basically, here I said I send this the background, right? I can extend it to say here's the entire background that you would, you may want. So I can say this is the picture of the world, right? I can send it once, and then all the so then I can say you can only really watch this much, but later when the camera moves, basically figure out where the other side, where what the view is, right? So there's a good picture of, of what, what happened. Um, so here in this particular scene, they have a picture of, of, of some computer science building, I think in Simon Fraser University, right? And this is all the picture. This is the whole entire scene, which they kind of glued together from the different video sequences. So you can see that some of them are kind of uh, sticking out kind of stuff. So this is a panorama of the whole scene that you could possibly see in this video. At any one instant, your camera is only looking at this much, right? So I send this whole picture, then I send what you're currently seeing, and what's this object, right? The, the object in this case is a back pipe, uh, piper, right? So the receiving end knows the whole, the whole scene, right? If you send it once, and then, it, then you tell it that even though you have the whole scene, I'm only looking at this particular square, which is a subset into that scene somewhere, and then you say, Within that scene, this is the user who is moving. So all I'm transmitting to you is this whole sprite of the, all the scene that is possible, right? And what I'm specifically watching, just the coordinates, nothing else. And then this, this user who is moving, right? This little object that I'm, I'm moving, right? So if this user was actually, instead of moving their feet, but actually moving like a escalator kind of thing, then essentially I can encode this whole scene very, very efficiently, right? Because in this case, the, the, I'm, I'm guessing the, 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 the player is going to move their feet uh, and mess. So if you, if you look closely, there's the, there's the socks and the feet, right? So if they move, it may mess up the, your prediction. But if they were to move like an escalator kind of thing, essentially I send this whole scene, I send the, the user, and let's say this escalator, then all you see is move the stuff. So I can get very, very good compression, right? So I'm going to show you one application which, which could use this technology, which I'm not sure if it uses, right? which is the, the iChat um, um, video chat. Right? Uh, it's the Apple video chat program. Right? I mean, some of you may have used this particular feature, um, which the idea here is, um, and you, you will see this in a different, different, different settings, and these are called uh, avatars and stuff, right? So when you do your video chat, most of the time, what you're seeing in the background, don't, don't look at it yet. So the, what you're seeing in the background is sort of boring. I mean, you're sitting in your dorm room or something. So you see like a, a boring background, right? You may not want that. You may feel you may want to appear like you are somewhere else, right? With die chat context, right? In the, in the context that we'll see in, in different systems, one is called a uh, tele-immersive um, um, video chat, which is all the rage for a while. The idea here is I want to be able to have this sort of a, this sort of a meeting right, virtually. Right? So I need to figure out how to do the display technology and stuff. But I want to make sure that we all feel like we are here. Right? So I want to make sure that you all look like you are in the classroom. So I want the background to look and, and kind of merge. I don't want your background to look like your dorm room and my dorm room and all those things. So I want to kind of separate out the background, remove the background, take you, and then put you wherever you are. So we will see in some of the systems, the, the idea here is I should be able to look over here and in the display see where you are, even though you are nowhere near me. You, you are somewhere else. I want to be able to see this stuff. And it's kind of distracting if I look over and I see you sitting in a, with a pajama and a dorm. So I, I want to be able to get rid of the background and make you sit there. Right? And, and some other systems even want to change the way you look. So they want to look like you're in pajamas. So you look like you're in a suit, whereas in real life you're just, you know, you're uh, sitting in pajama or something. Right? So they want to figure out how to get the background off. 
And it also helps a lot because now I have to only send the little bit stuff. I, can, I don't have to send the background stuff. So that's what we want to do in real systems. iChat does a you know, poor much implementation of those. So the idea here is, instead of the, the user sitting in some boring, boring setting, it gives you a set of pictures or video that you can add, and you can, you can put them, lay them as a background. Right? So the way they do that, if you use the, the program, essentially it will tell you to move away from the scene. Uh, it, it takes a picture of where you are. So if, you know, if I have the camera here, I sort of move away. It figures out what the background is, then it come back into the scene, then it overlays the background over me. Right? So it looks sort of um, nice or, or what have you. So in this particular video of the iChat demo, um, so he wants to show like this, right? He wanted to do the... Um, You can actually you have a picture or a video, right? But essentially, you can see if you if you look closely, you can see his his uh, his shirt is like you know see the jagged edge, right? But you ignore the uh, the effects, right? Sorry, this is not meant as a. Um, advertisement for, um, for iChat, but, but essentially, if you want to do that, right, the sprite feature is really useful because all I have to do is send you what my background has to look like, then I can send you what my object is. So I don't know if iChat uses that particular encoding, but if it did, it actually, you get very good compression and you don't even complain about it, right? Because this is the effect you wanted, and it's very easy to do because you already helped me by subtracting the background from the foreground. So all I'm sending you is this the picture that where you want to be, like you know the the background of the fish or our movie or so. And essentially, all I have to do is figure out where you are because in this case it is very simple because I I diffed the image, right? So I know what the background is, and I keep diffing those stuff, and it works for the most case, and I get very good compression, right? So that's one of the things that's enabled by MPEG-4, and that's one of the, that's one of the reasons why these are exciting. Because now I don't have to send the the whole image. I can I can send I can compose all this stuff. Um, so what I would, we would like to do is be able to take a video camera, walk around the scene, and be able to generate those sprites, which is very computationally hard. But in the scenes like the like the the one which are with iChat, you can potentially achieve uh, this sort of a behavior um, using MPEG-4, right? And you can also define the notion of a global stuff. Because one of the things you, you, you notice is all these things are taken with the camera, right? So if I know what the camera is doing, I know that I can predict what will happen to the whole scene, right? So if I'm, if I'm taking a camera and I'm moving it around, right, then everything in the scene is going to move at a certain pace, right? So rather than looking at it as a block by block, I can, um, MPEG-4 lets you say what, what is happening. So you don't have, so if you're zooming in, right, I can say I have the previous frame. I'm doing a global zoom, so everything would, would behave mathematically the way you would expect. So I don't have to send it as a block by block what is happening. I can do a global, uh, uh, figure out what, what, is, what, what, what is happening, right? And actually, this is a lot more easier than you realize because most of the cameras, if you're doing a digital camera, which is where we're, we're talking about this stuff, they already know what you're zooming, what you're doing, right? So if your camera's moving, they know what, exactly what is happening. So they can feed that into the, the compressor and say, the user is you know, zooming in, so send that information, use that information to figure out what the stuff is. You don't have to actually estimate it, you can actually um, use that to figure out what, what will happen, right? So one of the places I've, I, I, I saw they tend to use this is to draw those lines on, on football games, right? The football games, and they have all those hello lines, right? Um, I don't know, like one of the T-Pranks, they're showing how, how they do those, do those stuff, right? So essentially, for people who don't watch um, football or one of those sports, right? So this is the, you know, this is the actual, uh, the stadium and you have like certain set of real physical lines, right? They want to add like some sort of uh, um, virtual lines or virtual like stuff markers and, and stuff like that on the scene, right? 
So they don't want it. So the initial generation, they want to do it in a static image. So they can show this image and show what, what's going on. But the newer ones, they want it so that wherever the camera moves, you know, regardless where the camera is, you want this scene to be there, right? And you also want this line not to go over the players because people don't really like it when um, their player is overlaid with this stuff. So you want to do it in such a fashion where it actually looks like it's on the ground, right? So most of you have seen the stuff, right? So for that, they need to know where these things are. Right? They, they need to know where the, where the world is. They need to know where the camera is and need to know where the camera is moving. Right? So they can estimate this based on, they can run algorithms to figure out where the camera is and then see and do detection all those things. But what these guys do apparently is, they initially they go in, they mark all the stuff, they mark where the cameras are, so then you cannot move the camera, right? So you know where the camera is, you know where you're looking, then you get the information about what the camera is doing, and all the zoom and all those parameters to a computer. So it knows where the world is, it knows where the camera is, and it knows what you're doing to the camera, and using that it predicts where the, where the stuff is, that reduces the complexity of what they're trying to do, and apparently behind the, the, the trailer, they have a whole rack full of like um, eight core processors, like a whole, um, I figure like eight or 16 set of machines, just to add the stuff to, to one, one scene, um, and they could do that with such a f so few computers, which is a whole rack, because they, they have all this information, right? So they have all the information from your camera, which basically says how exactly where you're zooming, where you're, where you're looking and stuff. So it's predicting what it's seeing based on what the camera is telling, what, where, the, where the zoom is, not actually by looking at the scene and doing an analysis. Because doing a scene analysis in real time would be way more complicated. Um, but even what they have to do, they have a whole set of, a whole rack of machines which are doing this stuff. So essentially, if you, the, the, all these technologies are basically doing that. So if you, if you have the information, your, if you had an MPEG-4 encoder, it can basically say, take the last scene, just zoom in, um, and you get a tremendous amount of compression. Right? <laughs> And again, this is how we, I think your product gets started, not necessarily by taking a random image and then trying to encode, right? So if you apply a project, if you take a random camera, and then you take the video and then try to do it as MPEG-4, you're likely to do it as a H.264 kind of mode. You know, look at this block-based system, not as an uh, object-based system. And again, it sup supports a whole, whole different sets of um, uh, profiles and, and sizes. Um, and I think Apple only supports simple and main profile. And if you buy more expensive encoders, so this is one of the reasons why if you buy the professional video encoding tools like you know, Final Cut and all those things, um, which cost like a few thousand dollars, they essentially have more profiles and stuff and gives you more control in, in doing this stuff, right? And the, the more newer format is MPEG-7, which they didn't really change the, the compression itself, but they, this would develop more in terms of annotating the videos and, and figuring out uh, stuff about what the content is, right? One of the one of the limitation of all the stuff we looked at was the the MPEG one, two, and four were designed for you to see the movie on the other other end, without much sort of interactivity, with, without much sort of being able to specify what the object is. And MPEG seven and MPEG twenty one were basically designed to give some sort of a structure to the object. So you store MPEG-4 video, but then you should be able to figure out what the object is um, so that it can be queried, it can be searched, and all those things, right? So one example is you want to be able to kind of take a set of video sequences and be able to mark regions and have annotations such as helicopter or person or moving boat or something and be able to track them, right? And the reason is, if I, want, if, I, if I want to build the next generation of Google video search, then this is a way for me to tell this video search what, I'm, what you're looking at, what, what you're doing, where the video stuff is. Um, so then, then the search engines can use that to do whatever they want. Right? There, the other, other thing you want to do is develop video summaries. Right? Take a video object and be able to say what is in there. Um, you know, uh, for, for search kind of purposes. Um, so you have the whole video, but you can specify which region says what and be able to uh, specify the, the contents so it can be searched, right? And that is one thing missing in the whole M MPEG, uh, all the stuff, because it, the only goal was to transmit it to the other end. This is more of trying to figure out how to annotate those objects or how, how we can get make sense out of the, of the scene, right? Um, and so, so, so 
Um, currently, the standard is MPEG-4, and I think it will stay there for a while because the MPEG-4 can do a lot of stuff that we, we still don't know how to uh, use with it, and it will probably uh, be there for, for a while. Right? Right, so, so those, those are sort of the, the all you need to know about video at this point. Right? All the technology, where the, where the world is going. Um, and I'll finish up with, the, with, with what audio does. But essentially, you, you sort of need this stuff to figure out how, what you should do. Right? So for example, you, if you can think of what will happen um, when you have a surveillance video camera, how it should be encoded. right? So you see, you've seen you know, surveillance video camera all over the place, video or, uh, or cameras all over the place, right? Most of the cities, it seems like all the intersections, there's a camera pointing at the, at the, at the crowd, um, and, and so on and so forth. So the goal is, how do, you, how do you compress those videos? How do you send those videos, right? So how would you compress something like uh, a surveillance video? Can you think of some issues that would come up when you talk, when you think of a surveillance video, right? Surveillance video. Let's say you have a video on top of uh, looking at the at the um, parking lot, right? We have a video camera up there looking at the parking lot, right? Do you would you use any of this MPEG and all those things that we talked about, or would you have to come up with the your own compression algorithms, right? Um, how can you so? What do you expect will happen in a parking lot, right? Parking lot, you expect that the view is, is a very wide angle view, right? You, you don't want to have one camera per car. You sort of want to have for the whole stuff, right? You want, you see these cars coming in and out. There's a lot of things which are not moving, right? The lampposts are, are hopefully not moving and, and the roads and all are, are, are fairly static. And the cars are not also moving really, really fast. Uh, I mean, they move sort of fast, and then they they stay, stay still for a while, right? So the, the cars sort of move in, and they they're standing there for a while. So depending on what you're trying to do with those, depending on what what your what your what your goal is, right? For example, if you're trying to figure out if there is a free parking, if there's a, a free slot to move a car in, you need to do some kind of passing. You, you, all you need to know is whether there's any car in a particular slot or not, right? So you need to look at the scene to figure out what that is, or you may want to figure out if some uh, bad person, you know, you, you want to figure out what the, what the car license plate and all those things. So if you want to do what the car license plate is, you expect the license plate to be visible for a very small amount of time, right? Because unless the, the person is moving at half a mile an hour or something, they're going to come in and park pretty quickly, right? So you're going to see the video for a little bit of time, right? And all this play a role into how you want to do your, what, what you have to do, right? So for example, the speed of the which they move affects the frame rate, right? If your frame rate is you're doing one frame per second, then all you may end up seeing is the car over here, and in a second, it's parked wherever it's parking. So you don't get to see all the different frames, right? So you have to increase the frame rate to actually see what is happening when things are happening. But once the cars are all parked, Nothing is happening. Nothing is moving. So you you don't really need a high frame rate, right? Or the temporal redundancy is really really high, right? So that's one of the things you would worry about. And the other thing is the the spatial parameters, right? The, the iframe, frame, how much you want to be aggressive, right? So if you're trying to look at the license plate, so in a scene like this, the license plate may be fairly small, which, which, may, which may translate to, let's say, one macro block or something, right? So if you're aggressively comp compressing, because most of the scene is made of like clouds and other structures which can be aggressively compressed, this particular stuff, if you compress it aggressively, then you won't be able to see what the, pl what the plate is, right? So it's not a, as trivial as it sounds. Um, you can't just say, we don't want to use MPEG, right? Because different parts of the scene, MPEG would work, and some different parts of MPEG won't work, right? So the sky, MPEG would be great, I mean, because hopefully it's not changing all that much. But the different scenes, uh, how, how it would change, right? 
so that's sort of a thing that you you want to figure how how do you build these how do you if you want to build these things how do you how do you, how do you do this stuff right and and the, the the problem that i just mentioned is very very important because after 911 uh, everybody wants to put a video camera everybody wants to see what's going on and videotape them right and then you realize that it's it's sort of easy to put all the cameras it's sort of easy to collect all the information but you want to do something with it so then it becomes all tricky right how many of you gone to uh, London or heard about the cameras in London, right? There are lots of cameras in London. So if you if you ever go to London, um, pretty much wherever you are, somebody is watching you, or some camera is watching you, right? So there's there's cameras all over the place, right? Um, so what do you think? Is is it a good idea or a bad idea? So ignoring the privacy aspects, um, technically, do you think it's a bad idea or a good idea? Or put it this way, do you think that we can possibly have lots of cameras and, and do, know how to do something with it, right? And, and the answer apparently is no, we don't know how to do, what to do with it, right? Uh, because when they installed it, they really didn't know what they're installing it for. So they installed it with the video resolution is sort of like a VGA kind of thing, right? They sort of want to have this so you can kind of look to see where, where things are happening. So if you have one-to-one -one ratio of some human being or some computer watching each scene, then this whole thing works, right? So if you had somebody glued into looking at this camera, there are like, let's say 10,000 cameras, right? So if you have 10,000 people looking at each camera, trying to figure out what's happening, these sort of things work. But what you really want to do is, it's not feasible to have that many users, so you sort of want to see what the pattern is and all those things. And they chose VGA, which is 640 by 480, right? Which is really awful resolution, right? I mean, it looks good. I mean, you can see what's going on. So at 640 by 480, you can probably look at this room and see there are a bunch of people and all those things. But what you really want to know is who among you is the person that I want to recognize, right? And you don't have enough pixels to actually see that. I mean, all I can see is there are 10 people, not whether it's A or B, right? You don't have that kind of resolution. And again, the frame rates, right? If I want to send frame rates of like 30 or 60 frames per second, that'll be awesome when things are happening, but it'll kill the whole system because now I have to send 60 frames per second video to a central site or, or wherever this is being processed. So then it kills the system. So the, the normal thing you do is you you do few frames per second, right? So if you watch TV and you see those, um, the robberies in, in uh, grocery stores and stuff, right? You see the the very coarse-grained scene, right? How, how many, you've probably seen those things, right? Somebody's trying to seal something, so all you see is one frame of somebody walking in here, the other frame of somebody like over here with, with a gun or something where the face is all gone, then the third frame is gone, right? Because the frame rate is so slow, so low, that you have one or two frames and you're trying to figure out what's happening, right? So you have a video where you have 10 days worth of video, but the one event that you're looking for happens so quickly, you have one or two frames, and you can't really make out what's going on, right? The other thing is, it turns out, all these things, when you leave cameras on the outside, somebody has to clean them, right? Because you, you probably notice that you know it gets fogged up and mold and all those things, which is not a big deal if you have one camera, so I can probably clean, get this thing cleaned up and all those things. But when you set it up throughout the city, um, Getting them cleaned up, especially when they have tens of thousands and, and keep them all, all clean, is not a simple task, right? So um, one of the uh, people I'm talking to who, who, who knows the system is, they basically the point is the use of the system is it's a deterrent because people think that it's there and it's watching you, right? The, the user system is not what you can do with that because it's good to know in aggregate what's happening in, in London, you can see that Ag you know, Londoners are active and doing stuff. It's bad at pointing out to see specifically what is happening because the resolution, all those things, to do that is far com more complicated. Um, to know that London is alive is you don't need all the cameras, right? Because you can just go out and sort of see the thing. So it's it's sort of a uh, it's it's a it's, it's technically I think it's a waste because you just the the system you want is a lot more complicated, right? And there are a lot of, lot of examples of those kind of systems. We'll, we'll, we'll see some of those whether we get time and stuff. So one of the projects that they want to do is along the Red Sea, um, they want to put a camera every so often to look at the, the oil pipes, right? I mean, the Red Sea area is sort of um, politically unstable. 
So you want to make sure that there's nobody stealing, uh, uh, you know, uh, exploding the oil pipes, right? So they, I think they put like 10,000 cameras or something along the thing to figure out, to, to constantly monitor those, right? And again, you run into the same kind of problem. Nothing happens most of the time. When things happen, you, you want to prepare for those. You can't build a system for the extreme case and, and so on and so forth, right? So it's, it's, a, it's an important challenge because we want to solve that, but if you didn't think about it all that well, then um, you end up having um, MPEG-2 or MPEG-4. Then you realize that MPEG-2, um, yeah, it's going to do a spatial coding, right? So it's going to drop those frequencies. So, um, so if I want to look at the number of plates, I need to figure out, I need to have the resolution to capture that, right? I need to figure out that this number is like, say, one, two, three. I need to capture that, right? That means the quality has to be very high because otherwise I can see it's a red car, but I can't read the stuff, right? And that, that's because I know how these things work. So it's not the end of all. So then I have to figure out that maybe I should have a slice over here and the slice of this particular stuff would have less quantization than maybe on the sky or something. Then I can you know, tune it so that I can get this and the other half the, the way I want it. Right? So that, that's the reason why we're looking at this stuff. Right? So I'm going to rush through the audio again. Since I said you know it, it, it's it's fairly um, it's it's usually not so when you're talking about video audio is like much simpler. So we we can kind of ignore that. Um, so there are there are different. So uh, going beyond what we talked about in the in the last stuff in terms of the um, differential PCM. Remember the, we quantized the video uh, audio and then we, we tried to find the difference between the uh, previous uh, samples. Um, there are other things we can do, which is one of them is the linear um, uh, LPC uh, coding. Um, so if you know that we are, we are coding uh, voice, if you know we are, we are recording sound, then we know one thing. We know that the audio sound only lasts between a certain frequency band, right? Zero to, I mean, 100 to 4,000 4, 4, 4, hertz or something. But we also know that human, humans cannot make certain sort of voices certain sort of not, uh, sounds. So we can ignore those stuff that you cannot make, right? And that's, that's what we want to do, because we know what we can make. And we also know what we cannot hear. And we'll, we'll see what some, of, what some of those are. So there are some sounds that you cannot make. There are some sounds you cannot hear, especially in terms of how these relate to each other. Then I can compress these stuff aggressively where you cannot hear those. So since your ears cannot hear those, you won't notice a difference. And the, a good example of that is MP3, right? So when you take a CD and you, you encode the audio, most of the times you don't notice a, the sound looks good enough because the, your uh, ear cannot see many of the stuff, right? So one of the, one of the things is we cannot tell the phase shift if the audio pattern looks good enough, your ear can hear it. You don't notice a difference, right? So in terms of if you look at those two uh, patterns, one is shifted from the other one, right? So it looks like these two are different because at, at different times, points in time, they you have different values, right? But it's essentially it's shifted one way or the other. But turns out you can't tell the difference if it's shifted either way. Because here, here all, it, all it knows is if these two patterns, if these two symbols are similar, you hear it as same, right? So even though these, there's a phase shift, you can't hear it, right? So when I want to encode something, if the sound happens to be shifted from the previous one, I don't have to send it because you can't hear it because you, you cannot discern the facial, uh, the, the phase difference. You can only hear the, the sound energy in terms of the, what, what is happening, right? So that really helps me. So if I have to send two signals, I can ignore one signal because you just can't hear it. Um, and I'm going to skip over to the <coughs> other other stuff. So in terms of frequency, frequency is the tone, right? It's the, the, the treble bass kind of things. Um, a, a lower tone will mask higher tone, which means that if you have like a bass sound and a, and a treble sound, even if I can make both the sounds at the same exact time, your, your ear, if it's hearing the, the bass, it cannot hear the treble, right? So when there's a heavy bass, I can drop the treble, because even if I send it to you, even if it does rep uh, reproduce on the other end, you just can't hear it, right? The same is not true for the other ends. If I have a, if I'm sending a, a loud 
high frequency tone um, and you send the um, low frequency tone, you can hear both of them. But if you have a loud low frequency, then I can drop the high frequency, right? So the way I, I use that is if I'm encoding music or something, if I hear lots of, so I, I, I split this audio into different frequencies. I look at the different frequency band. If I'm seeing this lot of bass, I can completely ignore the high frequency because you just can't hear it, right? But your ears can hear it if the low frequency was not there. So it's not, it's not like the color one, color uh, vision thing where you just cannot see color as good as, as brightness regardless of what you try. Here you can hear the high frequency if there's no low frequency, but if there's low frequency, you cannot hear the high frequency. So I have to know what the uh, low frequency is and if the low frequency is there, I can drop the high frequency, right? Um, and the, the, the masking tone, the wider it is, the wider the band is. So if, if the, the bass is really uh, over a larger frequency band, so if you're going from 10, let's say 10 to 100 hertz bass, then that means the corresponding masking on the high frequency is, la is larger, right? So the amount of the, 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 the bandwidth at the low end uh, uh, um, figures out uh, how much you see on the other end. So if they're sufficiently farther apart, then the masking does not happen, right? It, so it, it goes with how, they, how, they, how your ear is uh, uh, set up, right? The other stuff is, if you hear a sufficiently loud tone, it takes some time for you to recover, right? So even if the, freak, the, the loud noise stops, you just can't hear anything for a little bit. So I don't have to worry, so if I know how much time it is, I don't have to worry about sending anything to you because I send something to you really loud, so your ears must, must be, um, Temporarily uh, cannot do anything, so I can so I can drop all the signals in in the for the for a, for a little bit because you just can't hear because your ear is still recovering, right? So we use that. In, um, so MPEG uh, compression essentially does that. So it, it takes a frequency, it, it takes us audio, it splits them into different frequency bands, and it tries to analyze each one of those to see what's going on. If it's out of base, then it can aggressively drop the high frequency components, and it can figure out how the separations are. So if the separation is not that much, then um, the, you have to worry about the masking effects. If they're, sufficient, if they're sufficiently large, then you can um, then you can either send the information over to the other end, right? Yeah, and there are different levels of uh, different levels of audio, and MP, the layer three is the MPEG uh, MP3, right? It's far more aggressive than MP1 and MP2. Um, it's far more complex to create this stuff. So even on your modern computer, if you want to rip, rip a CD, it it it's not instantaneous. I mean, it takes a lot more computation to create this stuff. Um, but it's a lot more trivial than what you do for video, right? Because there's there's only one waveform you're, you're looking at. Um, and, but the nice thing is the decoder can be fairly simple. I mean, you can, you can buy really inexpensive decoder. The, the encoding is a lot more uh, uh, competition intensive. But you, and, and the proof is, you know, we've used um, MP3s for the most part. Um, and they do a good job. Uh, essentially, they achieve all the compression because they're essentially tuning it to your human ear. So, um, you know. Uh, if you're using it for some, some other purpose, it's not a good thing. So if you're trying to analyze something, then MP3 is, is an awful format to go because um, if you're trying to analyze if there's a talk or something, then the, the masking effect won't be happening, so you won't be dropping all the uh, higher frequency components, right? Um, so essentially, um, the, the audio, audio component, you know, the, the book goes to two chapters. You know, there's a different set of stuff that the human ear hears than, than video. Um, but for the most part, audio is a lot more simpler, except if you want, if you see a, hear a drop thing. If you hear a clicking noise because the audio drops off, you notice that, right? So you might have noticed that if you're listening to a, a radio or something, if you keep, keep hearing lots of uh, changes in the audio, you notice that more than anything else. So um, you know, we, can, we can do a fairly good job, and usually we use that because in the DVD, you actually get much higher quality audio than, than video because audio is the one that you, um, it makes you feel like you're inside the scene. So I can aggressively drop the video a lot more. I tend to send a lot more audio because you, you tend to notice that, right? But other than that, audio is, um, this, this is all we need to know about audio. Um, the next section we'll continue with, uh, with, with what to do with this in the system sense, right? I'll see you on, on Monday. <laughs>